Good afternoon, everyone. We are in the home stretch of our Owen Linton Lecture Series, and we're glad you're here. On behalf of the Lovers Lane Foundation, I'd like to welcome everyone here in person and everyone online to this final day of our three-day Owen Linton Lecture Series. My name is Paul Ditto, and I'm the Executive Director of the Lovers Lane Foundation. This lecture series is underwritten by the Owen Linton Lecture Series Endowment, <clears throat> established in 1985 <clears throat> by Babs Owen and her late husband, Arch Owen. Last month, Babs turned 103 years young. And I think she's watching this online with her caregiver, Meredith, who you all met on our first day. So please join me <clears throat> in thanking Babs and her late husband, Arch, for everything they've done for the foundation and our church. And we're honored today to have their grandson, David Owen, here sort of representing the family. David, would you stand and be recognized? <clears throat> the foundation exists for really one reason, and one reason only, and that's to serve and assist our church, its ministries, and its members in their mission of loving all people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we do that by supporting our church financially through 42 separate endowments. The Owen Linton Lecture Series Endowment is just one of those 42. Each of those 42 endowments supports a specific area or ministry of our church, from campus preservation to education and scholarships, to missions and outreach, three lecture series, congregational care and benevolence, communications and technology, deaf ministries, special needs, children's ministries, youth and young adults, well, <laughs> I could go on and on. But there are really two things I really want y'all to leave with today knowing about the foundation. The first is to know that the foundation is strong, both financially and in bent streak. We are supported by a 21 member board, all of which are members of our church, and a 12 member investment committee that oversees our investment manager, Northern Trust. We have a 10 member development committee and a 14 member grant committee. Every grant that the foundation makes is approved by a two thirds vote of our grant committee. And the second thing I want you to know or leave with today about the foundation is to know that every single dollar that is contributed to one of our 42 permanent endowments, not a single dollar of that is spent on overhead or corporate expenses or operating costs. In fact, not a single dollar of anything that's contributed to those 42 endowments is spent at all. It's deposited and held in the corpus of one of our 42 endowments, and only the income earned on those funds is used to make these grants. And over the last 12 years, those 42 endowments, thanks to our investment committee and our investment manager, they've generated roughly a 9% average return. Last year, the foundation made grants to the church and its ministries of about $450,000, and this year, we expect to make grants to our church of more than half a million dollars. Well, that's enough about the foundation. You came here to hear the last of our 2021 Owen Linton Lecture speakers. You know, we're really excited about our Owen Linton Lecture series this year. Our overall theme is community heroes and Easter faith. We've already had two awesome speakers and today, you're in store for a third awesome speaker. On Tuesday, Dr. Perry, Dr. Terry Parsons brought our focus to the emotional stress so many people, including us, have experienced over this past year. And he left us with a message of hope, a hope that with God's help, we're gonna get through this. Then yesterday, we heard from Chelsea White about food insecurity in our midst. A message that I know struck, struck, struck home in the hearts of many of you, knowing how committed you and our church is 
to our food ministry. Today, outside in Watson Hall, our food ministry was packing literally hundreds of bags of fresh produce and rice and beans to be distributed. And Chelsea left us with a challenge, what I like to call a Proverbs 31 challenge, to speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves and to speak up and defend the rights of the poor and the needy. And finally today, Laura Bernstein will close us out with a message about heroes on the front line, heroes that we owe so many thanks to. So like yesterday and day before, today at the conclusion, we'll have complimentary take-home box lunches out just outside the sanctuary in Aldersgate Hall. Uh, any leftover boxes each uh, day has gone to a different charity, and today the leftover boxes will be going to the Jubilee Park Community Center in South Dallas. So let's get started. Macy, would you open us in prayer? Well, it is an honor and a privilege to be with you this afternoon. My name is Macy Liptoy. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Lover's Lane, and I'm so thankful to be with you on this Maundy Thursday. Will you please join me in a word of prayer? Lord, today is the day that we acknowledge and remember the night that you broke wet bread with your disciples. And as you gathered around a table with your friends, you said, this is my body and this is my blood. And so for thousands of years, we have joined together as one body to partake in this table. And as we come together today, we acknowledge that your spirit is present in this place. And in the ways that you have stepped out into the margins and advocated for the voiceless and fed the hungry, we too are called to follow in your footsteps. May this time together be transformative so that we may go out into the world to continue doing your great work. May we acknowledge that this week is Holy Week, the week that stands out above all others for us as followers of your Son, Jesus Christ. May our hearts be renewed and our lives be transformed so that we may go out into the world and offer the same love and radical transformation to all we come across. In your Son's holy and precious name I pray, amen.
Thank you to our mother and daughter music team from Walnut Hill Church, a ministry of Lovers Lane United Methodist Church, uh, Christine Bowton and Victoria Recalde. I serve as their congregation care pastor there. Our scripture reading this afternoon comes from two translations, the New International Version and the American Sign Language Version by Deaf Missions, which last year after a 38-year project became the first Bible fully translated into American Sign Language. From Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. The word of our Lord, thanks be to God. Well, hello and happy Thursday. Um, sometimes, very unexpectedly, God can drop a blessing into your life. My daddy had this saying when I was a little boy, when something good would happen, he'd look at me and he'd say, son, you nearly think God's in control. Well, this happened to me a couple of years ago. I randomly walked out to check my mail. And when I did, there was some people walking their dogs down there. They live in the next block and they're my neighbors, but I'd never met them. So we kind of exchanged pleasantries and over the next months I guess we got to kind of know one another and we became very good friends um, there is no doubt in my mind that this was a great blessing from God to meet Laura Burnside who is our speaker today it's this blessing is sustainable you can share it with other people Laura is the hospital administrator for John Peter Smith Hospital in Fort Worth. They have seven, seven plus, 7,000 plus uh, employees. And you can only imagine what she's gone through uh, the last year, 14 months. Plus she's had some health challenges of her own. But when you get to know her, this is one of the most compassionate, loving, qualified people that I've ever met. And she has been such a blessing uh, to me personally and to the people, to our staff that has met her here um, at our church. And she'll explain how that happened later. But Laura makes it easier for everybody, except in one area. After you find out about her, you know her heart, you look into her eyes, you see how compassionate she is. The part that she makes hard is during this pandemic area, every time you see her, you just want to grab her and hug her and hold on to her. So with that, I haven't even touched on the number of attributes of uh, our speaker today, but let's give a lover's lane welcome to Laura Burnside. Good morning, every or afternoon, I guess, at this point in time. Um, we have a video that we're going to open with right now, if we can. The shared mission of improving our community. It makes me feel good about what I do.
There's rarely a time when people don't ask me what's special about JPS. That's easy. It's the people. It's everybody that walks in any door at JPS. Our employees are unbelievable. It doesn't matter whether we're going through COVID-19 or whether we're going through turkey toss. The spirit of JPS is so incredibly strong. A little pandemic has not gotten in the way of the way you provide your care every day and the way you're taking care of our patients. That speaks volumes to who you are and the work you do. You never know like the thing that you say today or the thing that you say tomorrow how that may change somebody. To keep in mind that philosophy so that way everything you do every day um, you know you're seeking to make an impact in someone's life instead of seeing as like this is the one moment that I have with this patient. I think any small gesture, any small thing you do can sway the pendulum one way or the other. Thank you JPS because you are on front line to defeat Corona. Corona, away from us, away from us, we will defeat you. That was the best thing I've ever seen. I'm so proud that they came for us. We really appreciate it. We're family and we're proud to be here to help. It was important for you to understand just a little bit about who we are at JPS and the I, I'm so touched Billy Bob by your um, opening I consider you to be a dear dear person in my life and the only thing that would um, be more impactful or better for you all is if the 7200 people that I'm here representing were standing here with me they are absolutely the most extraordinary people doing extraordinary things that I have ever had the privilege of walking beside. At JPS, we have three simple rules we ask every employee to follow. They're own it, seek joy, and don't be a jerk. And as we um, move through every aspect of life, whether it's a pandemic or not, we still ask people to live and abide by those three simple rules. We've spent the last decades working to honor and value those who are on the front line. We've spent the last, I've spent the last 25 years looking for ways that we can care for those who um, care for others so tremendously. And so I I'd like to kind of end where you started the Owen Lecture series this week, which is really talking about hope. And if you can put up the, the slides, I want to honor our heroes, but at the same time, I could not be here on a beautiful spring day, April 1st. I believe it's even your pastor's anniversary today. Um, 26 years, is that right? 23 years. I, I'm, I'm advancing you. Um, 23 years of service. It is the beginning of April. It's spring and it's almost Easter, and there's no way that we could get into this without talking about hope. And hope is that feeling and that expectation that something is going to happen. And I think through the pandemic, that was never more real for all of us. That feeling of hope and that feeling of, you know, we will get through this. But through this past year, I've seen extraordinary people do extraordinary things with an extraordinary amount of strength and resilience and hope. And today I'd like to honor a few 
of those people. I could spend all day long talking about it, but I'd love to be able to honor our first hero, and that's Craig. Craig leads our environmental services team. He has a team of several hundred people. They clean all of the rooms in the hospital, whether you have COVID or you don't. And I want you to think about that as an environmental services worker, to have to have a cur the courage and the strength to walk through that room, through that door, and clean a room that may be a COVID-positive patient. There was one particular environmental services worker named Miranda. Miranda is a cancer survivor. And while many of the environmental services team members said, I'm out, I'm going to go clean a room in a hotel, I'm going to go do something else, Miranda didn't do that. Miranda said, I'll work in the COVID unit. I'll be that housekeeper that goes in and cleans every single one of those beds, every single one of those areas in which our COVID patients were. Craig knew he had to send his team members into something that could potentially cause danger, and yet he did it. Our next hero is a man named Jim Graves. Jim leads our respiratory therapy team. Jim's team saw every single COVID-positive patient that came through because they all have breathing issues. They all have lung issues. So Jim knew that he had to send his team to go take care of patients, be in an, a, an aerosol environment every single day. And I, I was really moved and touched by what Jim shared with me. And he said there were many a night when he would go to bed and tears would stream down his face because we didn't know. We didn't know what that meant. Was he going to send one of his family members, which we consider our team members at JPS, was he going to send one of his family members into a COVID-positive room and either they would contract it or they would bring it home and one of their family members would contract it and perhaps get very sick or die? And yet Jim showed up every single day and our respiratory therapy team showed up every single day because that's what they're dedicated to doing. Healthcare people don't run away from the fire. Healthcare people run to the fire. They have dedicated their lives to serving. They have dedicated every moment of every day to serving those even when it could cost them their lives. And yet they still do it. Our next hero is um, a, a hero that you know I, I really admire so very, very much. If we could put up the next picture. I love showing their faces because they become real. Um, these are our doctors. These are our doctors in the COVID unit. They're in Pappers. I, I remember a time last summer when I received a phone call from one of my physicians, and um, he was sobbing, 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 and crying. Let me describe the COVID unit, um, and they're the same just about, I think, in every single hospital. But what we found early on was when the PPE was um, limited, we thought, we didn't know, you know, were we going to have enough PPE to be able to protect ourselves from, you know, whatever COVID was. Because if you remember and pull yourself back to March of last year, if you pull yourself back to March of last year, when there was so much uncertainty and fear. Close your eyes for me for just a moment and think about that moment when you knew something had changed. You knew something had changed. And what were those emotions going through your body? You knew it, it was something different. For our caregivers, it was fear, it was being scared, it was anxiety, it was all of these things. And then imagine showing up at the hospital and saying, by the way, we're going to ask you to work in our COVID unit. So it's this big, huge unit. It's as close as you can imagine to like a mass unit in um, the military. So it's a big room and there are beds and the beds are several feet apart and all of the equipment that goes along with the bed is there. And um, the, the patients who are in there, it's an ICU unit, so they're very, very sick. Most of them are on ventilators, and our, our physicians go in there. And um, one, one night, as I mentioned, this physician calls me, and he's sobbing, 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 and he said, there's just too much death. I didn't go into this for this much death. And it wasn't just the COVID patients. 
It was patients who were too afraid to come to the hospital for health care. They were too afraid to show up because they didn't want to contract COVID. And so what we found were patients who were, had cancer, and had they come earlier, we probably could have saved them. And now it was stage four, and it was just too late. We found diabetic patients who found it preferable to sit at home and watch their limbs rot before they would come to the emergency room and come into the hospital. And so amputations and death from diabetes that could have been prevented was not. So these doctors showed up every single day. They showed up every day knowing that they were going to experience that, knowing that there was nothing they were going to be able to do for a number of patients that would walk through the door. And that is contradictory to what healthcare people do. They go in to save lives, not lose them. And if you'll put that picture back up, one of our physicians, um, actually, if, you'll, if you kind of look, it's hard to see, but on the um, picture where you can see the bodies of the, of the physicians, there are some pictures that are drawn on the PPE. One of our physicians actually drew cartoons, and so she would find out something about someone who was going to be working in the COVID unit. When they would show up into the donning and doffing room, everything was um, labeled because you, you rewore your your. Um, PPE as much as you could, and they would um, unravel their, their PPE, and they would find a cartoon character that, re that was related to something that they had told her. And so in the midst of all of this, she was living our second rule, which is seeking joy. It's amazing to me. Um, our next hero, if we can put up the next photo, is a woman named Debbie. Debbie served at JPS for over 20 years. Um, JP, uh, I called Debbie one Sunday morning at 8 o'clock in the morning, and I said, Debbie, guess what? She said, what? She was getting ready for church. I said, by noon today, we get to set up screening for all of our patients, all of our visitors, and all of our employees. That totaled at that time about 40,000 people a week. It's like setting up TSA in four hours, right? So um, she graciously came down to the hospital knowing, again, that her team members who sit at the information desk were going to experience every single person who walked through those doors. And they were angry. Because if you think about, if you had a loved one in the hospital at that time, the one thing that you wanted was to be with them. And we knew that wasn't safe. And so we had to tell them, we're so sorry, you can't be here. And that was really, really hard on our team members was hard because they, they do everything they can to serve our community. If you'll put up the next hero, this is um, one of our nurses, this is Pat. Pat leads our women's um, services division at the hospital. She's one of about 3,000 nurses that um, just unbelievably come to our hospital every single day to take care of patients. But we had this really weird phenomenon that started in uh, women's services. And what happened was um, all of our pregnant moms, expectant moms, were COVID positive, and we couldn't, almost all of them, we couldn't figure out why. And then we found they were having baby showers. It's not a good thing. So now all of a sudden we have a mom who's giving birth to a baby and we have no idea what's going to happen to that baby because we don't know the disease enough to be able to, to really have any information. And so Pat brought her team in every single day and here's what we got to tell all of our patients and you may have experienced this yourselves. You can't be with your loved one while they give birth. So in the moment of celebrating life, which is normally so joyous and wonderful for all of us in healthcare, you had to do it alone. And our nurses held the hands of those moms while they gave birth to their babies and they were the first people who saw that baby when it could have been their significant other. And it just, it just couldn't happen at that time. So not only were they holding the hands of our patients while they died, they were holding the hands of our patients while they were born. It's a pretty amazing thing that our caregivers have done. Our next hero is um, Leanne Franklin. Leanne actually leads our chaplains at the hospital, which means she is an absolute angel walking on this earth. Leanne has about 10 chaplains that work at the hospital, and they, they really dispersed and said, we're in. What do we need to do? Her team and our Care for the Caregiver team provided about 1,500 emotional support encounters a week to our care team. We have about 7,200 employees at JPS, so if you think about 1,500 emotional support encounters, just the ones we found, it's a large 
percentage of our employees that were hurting. And they were hurting beyond belief. There were story after story after story of caregivers sitting in their car and sobbing before they could even leave the parking garage. Crying because they were so afraid. Did I get it today? Did I not get it today? Am I going to take it home? Or in many cases, I'm not going home because I don't want my family to contract this illness. I'm not going home. I'm staying in a hotel with my coworker. I'm staying in an apartment. I'm not going to go home because I'm not going to put my family at risk. And they spent months away from their families. When I think about all of these heroes and all of the amazing things that they have done, again, extraordinary people doing extraordinary things, I can't help but hold on to what that scripture means to me, which is if we just trust, we will be guided. We are not alone in this, and there is hope. And if you'll put up the next slide, we decided um, last summer to do something a little bit different and start focusing on hope. And so this is what we called our hope tree. And our chaplains last summer, a year, now a year and a half ago, had gone to a botanical garden and they saw a tree that had a plaque in front of it that said, um, plant a seed and, and a tree will grow out of, or a hope that tree will grow or something along those lines. And it struck with them. And they decided that if we could put a hope tree together, that we could take it, and it, and it was this beautifully lit birch tree that we put on a uh, rolling cart and took it to all the different units, and there were these beautiful pieces of linen paper, and you could write on it what your hopes were. This one that's right in the front I love so much because it said, God's, God's love doesn't stop, it overflows. And in the midst of this, that's what one of our care team members wrote. And that hope tree traveled throughout the hospital, and it ultimately ended up at the entrance, along with another tree um, of gratitude, it, end, it ended at the entrance of our donning and doffing room. So as our caregivers came through to put on their PPE, to go work in the COVID ICU, they actually got to experience and share a little bit of hope. And I don't know how we would have gotten through this without that. In December, if you'll put up the next slide for me, in December, I got a phone call from Billy Bob. It was between Christmas and New Year's, and he said, I've been just struggling with what we could do to help your care team. We'd run into each other in the neighborhood as I was walking the puppies, and he'd always ask me, you know, how is it going? And it just seemed to be getting worse and worse. I said I was never, ever the person that anyone ever wanted to invite to a party, not that we were having any, but it was so depressing all the time <laughs> that, you know, it just, it was just almost more than you could handle, and so he was gracious and kind and really heroic in that, um, in that whole thing and supportive. And so I got this phone call that said, we have all these poinsettias in the church. We would love to give them to your team members to bring a smile. And we came and there, we collected over a hundred of them, put them in a van, shipped them over to the hospital. And this is, these are pictures of our team members um, receiving poinsettias that came from this church. That was my first time walking in this church. It was not my last, though. I find myself here very, very often these days. And it's amazing to me what the kindness and generosity of a stranger can do. It's amazing to me that a stranger to a stranger, an organization that you've probably never heard of, being in Fort Worth, and a church that I was unaware of, can come together and form a bond that is stronger than I can even describe. I don't know why this has happened. I only know that it did and there's a reason for it. And I'm incredibly grateful and honored and privileged to know the people that I have met here and to be here today to honor you and your family, David, um, during this lecture series. And I thank you for allowing me to be here. We brought the poinsettias to the hospital and we handed them out. And here was the message. We said, these came from a church we told them which one, and we said, their message to you is they want you to know you're not alone, that the community is holding you, that the community is supporting you, and the community loves you, and we're trying to provide you with strength 
and courage to come back and serve another day. I came back in the, the church that day after we loaded up all the poinsettias and I wanted to thank someone and the, one of the most powerful things that ever happened to me in my life happened. And I was taken down to um, the prayer shawl room. And I don't know if you've ever been in that room before, but the energy and love and compassion that you feel when you walk in that room is palpable. And I stood there looking at all of these prayer shawls just in awe that you have this prayer shawl ministry that I was absolutely blown away by. Again, I didn't know anything about it. And I mentioned um, that day that we had just lost one of our employees. And any time we lose one of our own, regardless of what the illness is, it's incredibly painful to our team. They're caring for them typically, and then we lose them. And it becomes just a, a really difficult time. And so um, you all were gracious enough to give me a prayer shawl to provide to that nurse's family, which we did. And we told them that um, they, would pray, they, they were being prayed for. And then um, we've been very blessed by you all because you, and if you'll put up the next slide, actually, we've actually given out prayer shawls a number of times um, so far, and every time we send the prayers. This is me. This was two weeks ago, actually. Um, I was in the hospital. I had emergency surgery. And when I woke up, Leanne, who I showed you, our lead chaplain, I had actually given her a prayer shawl when I got back to the hospital, and I said, tell me what we can pray for for you. You are giving it out every single day. What can we do to help pray and support for you? And we had given her this prayer shawl. And when I woke up from my surgery, the prayer shawl was around my stomach, which is where my surgery was. And I can't tell you the power that that had I have been wrapped in a prayer shawl since my surgery. And the comfort that I feel, Catherine described it as being wrapped in a hug. I miss hugs so much, you know? And yet I felt really wrapped in a hug and I felt wrapped in your prayers and wrapped in your love. And I'm so grateful to you all for what you do every single day because it makes a difference. What you're doing in the community, every word, every action, every single thing that you do matters. And at the end of the day, as we honor those who are on the front line, we honor those who have risked their lives. And there's so many more professions. I just, I know healthcare, right? But as we honor those people, I want you to know that your prayers matter and if there are times when you find someone who is a little snarky or a little off, offer them grace. We don't know what people are going through. Personally, people have lost so many. Professionally, people could be going to a place where they're scared, they're afraid, they're anxious, and they don't know if they're risking their lives or those of who they love. And at the end of the day, I have to believe with all my heart that Christ would offer grace. They would, he would offer hope. He would offer us the opportunity to know and support each other in a way that is just beyond. I have a friend who's really into rugby, and she watches it all the time. She loves it. I'm not familiar with rugby, but apparently you can only um, pass the ball backward. So you don't really know who's behind you. And so they use this phrase to let the other know that they're there, and they say, with you. And as I leave here today, I feel without a doubt and with every ounce of certainty within my being that you all have been with us. And for that... I can't thank you enough. I appreciate you honoring our heroes. It felt like we were driving uh, in a car, but the windows were fogged. And nobody in the car knew uh, where we should be going. Uh, but we knew that we needed to keep driving.
we had no choice. We had to do it. This is our job. This is what we know how to do best. As scary and as daunting as it seemed initially, we know this is something that we had to do. And so standing in the middle of the COVID ICU and you have patients that are refractory with their oxygen levels being super low, and you have to tell your teammates, I don't know what else to do. We've done everything that we possibly can do. And it's just, you just kind of feel like you can't help. And that's kind of like the most defeating uh, feeling. The patients would almost always ask me and they would almost always say, I'm not gonna survive, am I? And it was that realization that a lot of patients had. They were so sick that they may not come through this. And that was really heartbreaking and very difficult as, you know, being a physician to kind of look someone in the eye and, and have that conversation. We didn't know what the next week or month or year would look like. We didn't know what that would look like for us as healthcare providers in, uh, in America. We didn't know what that would look like for our patients or, or for their families. We have certainly learned a lot from the early days of this disease up until now. There's a whole lot of data. We certainly do have a better understanding. We are seeing the evolution of the course. Uh, we're seeing patients get better and leave the hospital um, and stay out of the hospital. And, um, and seeing that is really what, what keeps us going. There's always hope, whatever long, long or short, if, if the the few patients that we have now, and this is the little break that we have, I'm, I'm recharged. I've had enough time, and like I said, the support system that I have with not only the people that I, and colleagues that I work with, but my family and my friends, uh, and the side hobbies that I do. I skate a lot, so um, that kind of helps with the energy. There's always hope, and, I th and that's why we, we do what we do. We've seen the patients who have defied the odds and defied death, the miracles that have come through insurmountable odds. So there's always hope. Hope. There's always hope. And my wish for you this Easter season is that you find that hope. And I thank you for sharing our story and for allowing me to share the 7,200 people that I'm honored to walk beside on this journey. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. That was just an, an, an awesome message to close out our Owen Linton lecture series. I, I, I don't know about y'all, but I caught myself wiping tears from my eyes when I heard that. And I don't think I've ever felt more proud to be part of this church. Y'all make it special. So again, thank you, Laura. Before I turn it over to Victoria and Christine and Stan, I wanted to point out that on the back page of uh, your uh, program today is the Holy Week schedule for the remainder of the week. So starting tonight at 7 o'clock, we hope you can join us live and in person for our Monday Thursday concert, The Mystery. And please join us online Friday for our Good Friday service. That's Friday at 7 o'clock online. And of course, please join us, everyone, members, former members, visitors, guests, join us Sunday in celebrating the resurrected Jesus Christ at Easter. We hope to see you at one of our many Easter services this Sunday. All those services are listed on the back of the program. Please come. On behalf of Lover's Lane Foundation, thank you all for coming today and the two previous days. Thank you for tuning in online We've heard three great messages, and I've enjoyed every single one of them, but I don't think any of them touched my heart quite like this one did. So thank you again, Lord. So we're reversing the order of our closing hymn and benediction from what you see on the program. So uh, Victoria and Christine, y'all wanna take it over? Thank you. 
We will close with a hymn entitled, Forth in Thy Name, O Lord, and you are invited to stand and join in singing. The words will be provided on screen, and we do ask that you maintain your mask and position on your face as you're singing. Thank you very much. And thank all of you for being here and all of you who are online. Thank you for um, being here. And I know you are blessed by uh, being here today and being part of this service. I want to thank uh, Billy Bob, who uh, is our chief um, uh, flower delivery arranger here at Lover's Lane. And I'm thankful for Billy Bob bringing uh, Laura into uh, our lives here. And Laura, um, we have lots of Easter lilies lots of Easter lilies and uh, I know that many of them will need a home and we hope that they find their way to the great uh, John Peter Smith Hospital and the great work that's being done there. Uh, this was inspiring Paul, thank you, thank you to the foundation, thank you to the Owen family for making this possible for so many years. You know as we depart today, as Paul's already mentioned, there's a good lunch for you but behind the screen um, they are making uh, not just lunches, but uh, bas or, or sacks of groceries for people. And I think Randall said today uh, they will have um, uh, fed their 185,000th person uh, through the food ministry of this church that's been going on for a little less than a year. But before you get there, you're going to have to walk past a table that has lots of prayer shawls on it and some of the women who knit those prayer shawls are here in the room and are at that table. So just think about what we've heard today. Uh, think about the wonderfully inspiring testimony that Laura has shared with us. And I'll bet the Lord will put on your heart someone who needs a prayer shawl. And I hope that you'll pick that prayer shawl up and make a special delivery. Today's Monday Thursday. What a good day to make a special delivery. Or you could wait till tomorrow on Good Friday if you wish. Or you, you could do it on what we call Low Thursday or, or Saturday or Bright Saturday. Or you could even wait till Easter and make that delivery. But we have a few days to bring hope into the lives of even more. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.